to the session about travel being enhanced by resilience. So we all know that the travel industry can be fragile. There's the pandemic and various different national disasters and global travel less have shown over the years. But pre-pandemic, travel recovery has accelerated considerably. At the beginning of the century, 2001, it took, on average, 26 months for a destination to recover from a crisis. Now, it takes just 10. The pandemic, of course, was exceptional, unlike any previous crisis. And this panel will explore whether the learnings of COVID-19 has better prepared the industry for crises ranging from localized natural disasters to climate change and biodiversity. And joining the panel to explore the topic today are the Honorable Sylvester Radagon, the Minister for Foreign Affairs and Tourism for the Seychelles. Welcome, Minister. Dan Richards, CEO and founder of Global Rescue. Debbie Flynn, Managing Partner for the Global Travel Practice, or the Global Travel Practice Leader for Finn Partners, and Robin Ingle, CEO of Ingle International. I'm Arnie Weisman, I'm Editor-in-Chief of Travel Weekly. So, and has our other panelists arrived? Coming around the corner, okay. Minister Bartlett. Welcome to the stage. Can you see that? <laughs> ah, okay. So we're, we're actually going to begin uh, while the minister gets mic'd. You know, COVID-19 has proven to be the biggest crisis that our industry has ever faced. And overlapping it, we're seeing the effects of two additional global crises namely climate change and a significant reduction in biodiversity. Now, are there takeaways from what we've been through in the last few years with COVID that could apply to our long-term challenges with climate and biodiversity? Let's start with the communications perspective. Debbie, what do you think in terms of what we learned about COVID that could be applicable for future choices? and Tom said apologies for my, my voice today. And I think it's very comfortable about communication. I think there were many destination um, and comments that did not have communication in the prior to COVID. And Right. 
students are going to the next right and then participate, which is the reason I go to travel. What are they looking for? What are they looking for? What are they looking for? They do care about giving more money in the country and we're going to communicate that to them. And then it's up to Betsy. It's about showing you've got the willingness to evolve as a country or a child or a hotel. So, Minister Bartlett, uh, well, we need to say it. Uh, perhaps you can comment from the perspective of government. Uh, what did Jamaica learn from the COVID crisis that might be applicable to basic climate change? We started to learn by trial and error. So I think the big lesson for COVID-19 is collaboration. It's about being together. In fact, we invented a nice phrase called together apart. We learned that together was a critical word. The operative word was together. But we could also do it apart. So that we were doing it virtually, we were talking to our friends in uh, Singapore and our friends in Kathmandu. And we were all saying pretty much we have a problem. And then asking the same questions as to how to get out of it. And then finally we learned that the discussion about globalization could have a little meaning. Because we're all looking for answers now from a single source. And we all were looking. And what was the source? The source was science. And then the source became data. So we were looking to science and data to provide us with, with answers. And then we all together developed something we call protocols. So now we were all trying to say the same things. The same things we could do. That in fact if we act in a certain way, you know, we learn what the virus was. And then we learned that we couldn't quite cure because we didn't have nothing, but we could mitigate and we could try to manage. And, and we did all of that together. And the result of that level of collaboration, global collaboration, the lightness of which I don't know if man had ever seen. We were able in the shortest possible time to manage a most <coughs> consequential and perhaps potentially most eviscerating event in human history. We were able to get around it, about it, not quite over it yet, but definitely managing it. And we are able to survive and we start to be together again and not just together. So I think the big lesson from COVID for all of us is the value of acting, thinking, and working together, suddenly discovering that we are in fact humanity. Thank you, Mr. So even before the, uh, before the pandemic, uh, the travel industry always seemed to be facing a crisis somewhere, a natural disaster, hurricane, volcano, uh, or a civil disturbance somewhere. And that, we learned the resilience, how we were able to address it. When we're looking at climate change, 
we're looking at a, a, a rather odd type of crisis, one that has a very, very long-term impact, but also many, many short-term results as, as, as it goes forward. So, uh, Minister Redegan, in, in the Seychelles, uh, the World Bank has actually specifically looked at some of the likely consequences of climate change. And they're actually some of the same types of events that you've already dealt with. So storms that cause landslide, rising oceans and storm surges that cause flooding and shore erosion. So what has your government learned from past that they're using to prepare for what might be an inevitable series of consequences of climate change? How is the government prepared for that? We're being affected by a phenomenon that we're not responsible for. You know, in terms of what we've done over the years, in protecting the environment as an example, even before it was involved, we've done our bit to, to do our share in protecting the environment, not only for our country, but also for hopefully the world. What we've found is no matter no matter what, we are we are affected. Yes, you've, you've cited the, the various uh, calamities that, that hit us more and more often now than, than they used to. So what we need to do is just, we need to protect ourselves. We need to have a plan to, uh, to try and mitigate. We are into mitigation now. You know, I, I, I drive around the islands. I live on the main island. I drive around. I see every day, you know, the waves that you used to see meters away. Sorry, and I'm crashing literally over over your car as you as you drive past. You know, we are in a in a dire situation, so we've got to have a plan to mitigate. But we can do so much as a small country that depends primarily on tourism. The resources are limited. You know, we're trying now to to put up barriers, and the barriers are, are having to to be pushed a little bit further, but higher to try and break the waves that, that come ashore. We try to look at, uh, at our buildings where we, we build. We can no longer build a few meters from the shore. We've not reached a stage like certain island countries have had, where they've had to relocate the population. We're not there. But we have it in our planning to build further inland, do more in-depth impact assessment studies before any significant construction is done. There's a lot of education that we have to do, and we start that in school at a very young age to educate the, the children, educate the population for the measures that they need to do as a country, as a community, to protect the environment. So, Minister Barbara, also hurricanes are something that Jamaica has lived with for years. They're predicted to be more powerful and more frequent coming through. What is the government of Jamaica? I think we need to do, and we've learned that to build resilience is at the heart of being able to first of all attract these phenomena, these weather events, and now coming with greater intensity than ever before. And then to mitigate, and to manage them when they come, and then to be able to recover, and to recover quickly, and then to thrive after. So these, these five are the key critical steps that as a government and um, for, for our sins, Debbie, we all have conspired to create a, 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 an institutional framework within the university and Dan, Dan is here, he understands this one very well. And so, um, uh, we've created a global tourism resilience and crisis management center at the University of the West Indies in Jamaica. The purpose of which is to assist governments and uh, individuals, more importantly, to create a, a basis for academic rigor and for research and deeper diving into data and analytic work to create tools to assist countries in dealing with these global uh, phenomena that are driven by weather. And in the case of the as you know, 
every year for the last 50 years we've had, and they have become more intensive. But to therefore create that opportunity for education, public education, as well as formal education on weather phenomena in the region, to be able to predict when they are, to be able to mitigate, do things within our space now, to build capacity so that when they come, you can manage, you can survive, you can move on. Uh, strategies for communication, so the communities know, but more important, they know what to do. Strategies for collaborating with the private and public sector with resources, to make those resources available, so that they can also be um, drawn on immediate action, an immediate response. And then, of course, to create uh, public uh, and um, legislative and regulatory arrangements public policy range that enables people to know what to do, when, and within what framework. And most importantly, to ensure that there are consequences for not doing it. Because very, very important. So, in a simple sentence then, what the government of Jamaica has done is to create a whole framework of legislative, regulatory, policy, and private sector involvement to enable management of these resources in the So we are of course still facing a very, very significant uh, pandemic. It is not over yet. And Dan, uh, back in 2009 at WTTC World Summit, I was actually on a panel that had, was talking about pan the threat of pandemic. And John Walker, who's the founder of Oxford Economics, was on the panel. And he predicted with uncanny accuracy what would occur, what we just all lived through. He foresaw a decade before COVID that industry would lose $2.2 trillion globally, or the government's need to look at contingency plans right away. He served on the U.S. Department uh, Commerce Travel Tourism Advisory Board. Uh, given that travel is the primary vector for to spread disease globally, was the possibility of pandemics ever discussed? And if so, are we any less vulnerable today to the impact of the next pandemic than we were in March 2020? Can you handle that news? I hate to be fair of that. You know, look, I'm a guy that when things are good, nobody wants to talk to me. When things are bad, everybody wants to talk to me, right? So things are now getting to be pretty good, so most people don't want to talk to me. But the, look, the reality is, I wasn't on the travel and tourism. I wasn't at Commerce. Um, coming up to the pandemic, I joined just as the pandemic was gathering steam. Uh, the reality is, is, we have an enormous amount of work to do in order to prepare ourselves to prevent this from ever happening again. So we were involved in architecting the recommendations technology and travel for the Commerce Department. And it's very clear to me that unless the U.S. government and all of our governments come together on one or two, we need to depoliticize the way that we look and analyze at what happened over the last you know, almost three years. That depoliticization has not happened yet. And part of the reason is that there are parts of the world that are still very much deeply in but there's some very clear and obvious things that worked and that didn't work. And I hate to even frame it this way, but we as a species, to some degree, dodged a bullet. It could have been a lot worse than it actually was. And it has the potential to be much, much worse. Unless we take real action. And there are, there are basically three things that we need to do. And I call on governments and this is the recommendation that we made to the United States government. Number one, we know what the actual vector of transmission is. It's human breath. It's not skin-to-skin -skin contact. It's not bodily fluids. It actually is an exhaled breath. We today, right now, have the technology to deploy at scale the ability to analyze human breath for these kinds of pathogens. And to be able to have an early warning system 
so that it will always be like a missile gets launched. And when a missile gets launched, the United States knows that the missile got launched immediately and we're able to take um, any defensive action. We have to be able to do the exact same thing when it comes to these packages and their emergency in the future. And we have the ability to deploy that detection capability very quickly. But we have to have the will to do it. So that's number one. Number two, therapeutics. The, the, you know, there were a lot of lessons that we learned and people did the best they could with this last experience. But therapeutics were underemphasized and to the detriment, I believe, in our, in our advisory panel believes, um, you know, to, to, to recover. And we have the ability to develop and deploy a broad range of therapeutics to be able to respond quickly, much more quickly than the vaccine regime. What we discovered was we created vaccines incredibly quickly, which was an incredible thing to accomplish. The other thing we discovered is that A, didn't work very well, and B, were very difficult to deploy quickly at scale, right? So therapeutics is a good answer. Number one, you need to identify the enemy, the enemy being the pathogen. Number two, you need to be able to deploy mitigating measures, which is the other key tactic in learning that we made a recommendation for. And then number three, you need to be able to coordinate across large geographies. I mean, every country around the world basically did a, had a different strategy. And then within the United States, we had 50 states, and all 50 states had a different strategy. That's not necessarily the worst thing in the world because you have, it's almost like a laboratory. Some are going to do very, very well, and some are going to do very, very poorly. We need to be able to clearly identify which strategies work. We know that lockdowns don't work real well, right? The economic damage that they provide to the places that are locked down is, is horrendous. So locking down societies doesn't work very well. We need other measures. We need to come together, make these decisions, put the money and the calories behind the point of the technology. Otherwise, we're no better prepared than we were three years ago in the one mutation way. Let's not let that happen. So to follow up there is a governments tend to always have their eye on the next election cycle. Private industry has, has its eye on the next quarterly reports. Is there a way to get a more long-term focus for both government and private sectors, or are we relatively <laughs> going to go through this again until finally a pathogen so very much just solves the problem for us? You know, look, after 9-11, the United States government enhanced its security procedures throughout the country, and that had a ripple effect around the world. How many significant terrorist attacks have there been on U.S. soil or other places as a result of using you know, airplanes and aircraft since 9-11? Zero, right? So we have the ability to be able to do that. We have to have the will to be able to do it. And if we, if we come together and recognize, it, again, it requires depolitization to, to be able to make a decision that we're just not going to allow this to happen again. Because we do not want to end up in a situation, you know, in the 14th century, you know, the bubonic plague wiped out a third of Europe's population. You know, we lost somewhere between six and a half and seven million people to COVID, which is a tragic and unbelievably large number. But it could have been 70 or 700 million. That's what we're dealing with. And if, you know, look, a lot of the topics being talked about here today, sustainability, climate change, environment, incredibly important. None of those topics have the ability to inflict the kind of damage, not only on our industry, but on us as a species, as these pathogens. And we've got to take it seriously and need to address it. We should be addressing it now. So, I mean, what role do you see in the insurance industry, the insurance industry, and everything we've been talking about going forward with climate change has got to pay, or is likely to have to pay, uh, for the results that the economic losses for these crises, uh, they have a lot to lose. So, uh, where do you see when you, when you advise insurance companies when you're dealing with them? What do you see and where is that? What can they do, if anything? What are they doing? Well, I take this one step further. The human species has a problem with amnesia. Um, three years ago is not unique. If you were in the Middle East, you had MERS. You go back to 2009, you had H1N1. 
You had SARS in 2003. It's there. Things live around us, in us, on us. We don't want to think about it. The environment is affecting us every single day. Sustainability is an issue we as a human species have to think about. It's not difficult. I don't want to be here preaching, but it's not difficult. When you want to plan, you take in all of those areas and you think about it. How are your citizens going to be in the next 10 years, 20 years? Look at the kingdom here has their 2030 plan. That's important. The Chinese government, communist government, used to have a 50 year plan. Governments in the world today have a vote oriented plan. Companies have a quarterly plan. They focus on profits today, but forget about profits tomorrow. Where do we want to be? Sustainability is sustainability as us, the world around us, the things we build, the companies we have, making sure that the people can be fed properly. Do you know that famine today happens more because of civil unrest and war than the environment? The environment's a secondary issue. To say this crassly, we're screwing ourselves. So it's not hard. What has to happen is from the top. It has to come from the bottom. And it has to be together. It has to be collaborative, and you hear that in the main stage. It has to be cooperative. The WTTC mm -hmm. did something amazing. An organization made up of 177 CEOs at the beginning in March 2020 it organized a call every hey, Wednesday to bring together everybody governments associations industry everybody was on those calls and everybody like the British say were gobsmacked they didn't know what happened to them I have taught crisis management 30 years. I have a security background, I have an insurance background, I have a healthcare background. How come I knew? You know, it's a bit of a joke. We started ordering PPE at the end of 2019. I had our companies ordering laptops at the beginning of 2020. I had a son stuck in January 2020 in Chiang Mai because he couldn't get back to China where he had a job. So we all knew about it. Simple thing, Arnie, coming back to this is we have to plan. We have to plan in our families. We have to plan with our society. And we have to plan in our companies and with our government. And like Edmund Bartlett talks about, the Resilience Council getting together and joining up these ideas, sharing them, and not be embarrassed, not be worried about it. And coming to panels like this is really important. You know, there's people in the audience here, far back in the audience, that are depending on the government here in Saudi in making this 2030 a success. What they don't realize is that they're part of that success. It's not just the government. One, one, one word answer to this question. This can be the last question. We've got to wrap up already. Having listened to what everyone has said, having thought, if, if you can do it in 30 seconds, in 30 seconds, because I think in all of this discussion, when we're talking about the recovery and resilience and so on, I think we've committed one key factor. We have not discussed the human capital disruption that we need to recover from. We have not discussed the fact that we employed a little over 400 million people up to 2019 in tourism. And that was 10% of global employment. And that we lost nearly 72 million people to unemployment 
during the two years of the pandemic. And that now that we're recovering, only 18% of that amount has come back to work for us in tourism. So pretty close to 60 million people are out there who are saying no to tourism. That's a big elephant in the room. And if we're to talk recovery at all, you know, we have to talk how do we get our people back? How do we recover with the people so that we can in fact have a true recovery? So I want to spend a minute on that, if you will, and, and, and that's my last comment. Yeah. That's my last comment. Okay. My last comment is that we have established a global task force called TEAM, T-E-E-M, and that is Tourism Employment Enhancement Team. For my sins, they asked me to chair it, but it's important because this is now a whole group of folks who are beginning to talk about true recovery. Recovery cannot happen leaving the people behind. And people are the heart of tourism, and the workers of tourism are central to the future of tourism. Thank you, Nick, very much. Oh, thank you. Okay, we've got seven seconds. Are you hopeful? One word answer. Yes. Yes. Yes, definitely. Okay. So, we can just, uh, well, thank you very much for your insights, panelists. Very, very interesting. Uh, we've got to quickly tell you that the sessions, the next sessions, are maximizing the tourism options for the Middle East and the main stage, the rising cost of travel in Europe and the media theater, enhancing connectivity in the Americas and the breakout stage one, which I'll be at, and the recovery of travel in Asia here at breakout stage three. You can also watch any of the breakout sessions you missed on the virtual platform where they'll be available on video on demand. All this information is also available on the event app. The next sessions are taking place in four minutes at 12.35, so please make your way quick for your next choice. And lunch will follow the next session on the terrace. Thank you.